All things require a source of energy in order to stay alive. This source of energy is respiration, the chemical process that breaks down a sugar, glucose, in order to release the stored energy. Different living things get the glucose they need in different ways. Plants are autotrophic, which means that they make their own glucose through photosynthesis. Animals are heterotrophic, which means they feed on other living things. We can show these different ways of getting the energy each species requires in a food chain. The arrows in a food chain show energy being transferred from one living thing to another. Every food chain starts with a plant, which captures sunlight through photosynthesis and uses this energy to make sugar from carbon dioxide and water. Herbivores are animals that eat plants. These animals are also known as primary consumers. Carnivores are animals that eat other animals. These are also known as secondary consumers, and so the food chain continues. Very unusual for food chains to be more than three or four species long. This is because at each stage, only a small fraction, somewhere around about 10% of the energy, is passed on each time to the next species along the chain. For example, only 10% of the energy consumed by a herbivore is passed on to a carnivore when it is eaten. The rest of the energy is transferred into less useful forms, for example by the animal moving, keeping warm or coming out in faeces. It's this transfer of energy to less useful forms that limits the length of food chains. If we combine all of the different food chains that show feeding relationships within an area, we can put together a food web. If we count up the number of individuals for each species in a food chain, we can create a pyramid of numbers. This can be very unbalanced, as some species are so much larger than others. For example, a single oak tree supporting many thousands of small greenfly. A pyramid of biomass is a much better way of showing what's happening, as it takes account of the size as well as number of individuals. Each level, known as a trophic layer, shows the total amount of living material. The difference in size of each bar as you move up the pyramid shows the amount of energy lost to less useful forms through keeping warm movement and so on. We've seen that animals can have a predator-prey relationship. We'll now look at other types of feeding relationships that animals have between different species. Parasitism is where one species survives by feeding on another without the other species being killed. For example, head lice, tapeworms, fleas and mistletoe. In each of these, one species gains energy from the relationship while its host suffers. In contrast, mutualism is a feeding relationship where both species rely on each other and both species gain from the presence of the other. For example, oxpeckers feed on the parasites living on large mammals like zebra. The oxpecker gains a food supply and the zebra has its parasites removed. Cleaner fish feeding inside the mouths of sharks is another mutualistic relationship. Another two examples of mutualism that you'll need for the higher tier exam paper are the nitrogen fixing bacteria that live inside the roots of legumes. Also, the bacteria living inside tube worms that live next to deep sea vents. These bacteria produce sugars from the materials being released at the vents using the energy directly from the vent. In return, the tube worms provide a safe and stable environment for these bacteria to survive. In summary, Food chains show the energy being passed from species to species when they feed. Energy is lost at each trophic layer, and this is shown in a pyramid of biomass. Some animals rely on the presence of another species to survive. Parasites do this to the detriment of their host, whereas in a mutualistic relationship, both species benefit.